Hello there. Today we're going to be pour, learning how to pour up a set of alginate impressions to make a stone model or a plaster model, whatever material you're going to be working. Uh, you may have seen my other alginate video. If you haven't, you can go check that out in my video list or whatever. And let's get going with looking at our tools that we have today. So one of the main things that you're going to need, a couple bowls, either a single bowl or multiple, depends on their style and we'll go over different methods. You're going to need a vibrator to be able to vibrate all the bubbles out when you're doing the pouring process, but there are also other techniques to pour without using a vibrator. We'll get to that here in a moment. You need a mixing spatula, so there are different types of metals or plastics kind of preference. I've seen people use butter knives out there in the field. Kind of whatever floats your boat and what makes the job, gets the job done. It's nice to have a couple of cotton tip applicators to kind of poke out some of our little loose bubbles that we're waiting on. And sometimes you may have a couple of these little squares that you can place and flip over your stone model so that they can go and uh, finish up the uh, hardening off to the side without having to disturb or leave it right here on the tray. One of the main things. One of the main things that we're going to go into here is going to be our alginate impression. Well, this alginate impression was taken today. It was moistened uh, with a wet paper towel, disinfected, and it is ready to be poured up at this instance. We have a maxillary and a mandibular. So first one that we're going to start off with is going to be the maxillary. So let's go ahead and get that exposed and ready for us to go and work with. Typically with this, you're not going to need a lot of the extra bits of alginate that stick out from the sides or anything. So if there's anything that's uh, really just extra alginate, we can go and kind of gently click those off. At the moment, we have a fairly decent uh, impression that I got here today. Uh, has a little extra on some areas, but I'm just going to keep everything here intact so that we can go on to it later. Um, there may be little bits of food particles that are left behind. If that wasn't taken out during disinfection and washing it, then make sure to get all of that taken out. Some people like to get these a little bit dried or hit it with a little bit of an air water syringe to get any type of liquid or saliva or moisture out of there so that we can move on with our next portion. But this is my mandibular impression. My maxillary is going to be right here. That's the one that we are going to pour up here. And same thing, little blurbs every, uh, every here or there, so, but we're going to leave all this intact. And it's already been rinsed and washed and disinfected already. Um, first thing that goes, you can go into your stone or your, uh, your stone powder or your plaster powder. And some people out there may be purists and like to use a scale to go and weigh these out by the gram and then weigh out your water by the milliliter. But we're, today we're going to be going by eyeballing. It might be the unpure way, and you might get uh, that people might say that it's not the strongest version to make the strongest dye model or the strongest study model, but it's what usually gets the job done out there in the field. So what we're going to do is we're going to scoot this over here, and we're going to make our way over to our sink, and we're going to pour our um, pour out some water into our bowls. Another thing that may happen is that some people are going to say to start with water inside of their bowl first and then pour stone onto it so that it's water first stone, it pours into there, it starts to d dissolve and gets really incorporated into the water and you start slowly mixing and you keep going there and there. Typically out there in the real world, you're going to get a bowl of material, slightly have a drizzle of water over there and then mix it to your consistency that you want. So let's go ahead and take a little bit of this material, which is the way I'm going to do. Now I'm going to pour it into my bowl so I can go and pour up one of these models. And I'm going to keep a little extra off to the side in case I need to make a little bit of extra. But let's go ahead and move over to our sink so that we can get that started next. From here, we're going to go and take our spatula and our bowl and get our water at a relatively calm drip. Or a calm little stream. We don't want to go overpower this. That's how you get. Uh, that's how you get your ratios off, and you're kind of jumping the gun on there. I have my material in powder form. I'm gonna go and start mixing here. I'm gonna go and flick it under here. Get a relatively nice amount to begin with, so I can start having all of it uh, mixed together and start to get a little bit more chunky, but it's still powdery. So we still want to get it to a little bit more of a smooth consistency. Now that all my material has kind of chunked up, I need to go get it smoother. You want it kind of smooth like sour cream, where it kind of holds on to the uh, holds on to your spatula 
but with a little vibration it will fall off. So as we get this, and I'm going to go and mix all my all my powder and water together, I'm going to start having more of a sour cream-like consistency. That's about just what I want. I don't want it too thick. I don't really don't want it runny at all. But now that I got this all mixed together, just as so, you're going to want to get the air bubbles out of there. So I'm going to turn this off right here, and here's a couple ways that we can go about that. Let's move back over to our other area. There. From here, we're going to go and move over into actually vibrating the bubbles out of our pour. Now, you can go and use a vibrator, and that's a really good way about getting the air bubbles out. Protect your vibrators by putting a tray cover wrap or something over it so that it does so it's not such a hassle to go and uh, clean up later. I'm going to put my extra material to the side, and I'm going to go turn my vibrator on to a low setting. From there, we're going to go and get our mix going, go and push down on our bowls, kind of flex our bowls to go and push those bubbles up. If you don't have anyone else around you or you're not worried about the noise, you can go and turn this up to a medium. And then we can keep on going from there until the bubbles all finally get on out. Push it down really hard, squeeze, squeeze, tap, 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 squeeze, squeeze, tap, 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 squeeze, squeeze, tap, tap, tap. That's going to negotiate a majority of the bubbles out of the material. From there, we're going to keep this on a low setting, and we're going to put this off to the side right here, but still within range. We're going to get our actual alginate impression, and we're going to hold it at a sideways angle so it's kind of tilted and lifted, and we're going to bring a small little scoop of stone and pour it into one of the, farthest, uh, one of the top corners as I lean it. If I put a little bit of material there, my stone is going to go and fall into the different areas of the teeth and it's going to slowly roll. If you notice that it doesn't roll anymore, grab a little bit more material and get that vibrated onto there. If you turn up the vibration higher, it's going to roll a little bit easier, but you don't want to go and slam a whole bunch of out, a whole bunch of stone right on it. That's how you're going to get air bubbles trapped into your system. As I lean it and curve it around the bend, that's how it's going to start making its way towards the other par portions of our teeth. I'm going to use both sides and make sure that it goes into all portions of my um, into all portions of my cast. If you do not have the luxury of having a vibrator, what I tend to do is do the same thing: place it on one end, just as so, and from there I'll just give it a little bit of tap until it shakes it out, and it also goes and bends around the rest of my. Uh, a cast here. I like having these little air water, uh, a little bit of these cotton tip applicators in case I see some stubborn bubbles that do not like to come out. I can go give these a little poke and start popping them here and there. But let's continue with pour ups on this model with the vibrators use and a little bit of tapping in between. Now that I have all my teeth filled up, I'm going to give this a little bit of a fill in right in the middle, just as so. give it a little tap so that all, all the stuff starts floating around and starts filling up all those different areas just as such. Now with that, depending on what type of model you're trying to make, if you're trying to make it for a study model or you're trying to make this for bleaching trays, your thickness is going to vary for that portion. Now I'm going to turn off this vibrator here because I do not want this to go and pancake out because it is a little bit liquidy. We don't want this to go and create a pancake when we go and flip it over or leave it in the position that it is. Uh, but from this portion, we're going to go and look at making a base or a topper for this. If you're doing like a bleach style tray, you're not going to need that much of a base because it's going your bleach tray um, study model is going to be fairly thin, just enough to be able to get teeth recorded. Uh, if you're trying to get a really thick cast so that someone can go use it at a dental lab or something, you need, might need to follow a 3 4 inch uh, base and then your teeth on top of that, whatever it may be. Uh, but with my material, the main thing I want to do is keep on watching this and don't let it go by. Uh, if I have two teeth that I want, or two casts I want to go and pour up, I can do that at the same time also. Such as in this case, I'm going to use the tapping technique since I have two, I have enough for two materials. 
what you can use is the same bowl that you have been using to pour your material and you can just tap it into place just as so. If you need to add more, grab a little bit of the scoop, add it to the, add it to the inside, tap it until it rolls all the way around the bend, and if anything falls out of your, of your alginate impression, it falls right back into the bowl, no waste, no harm, no foul, until this taps and gets nice and everywhere that way I need to. Look for any bubbles, you can always vibrate them out. If you're doing a tapping technique, it's definitely nice to have your con tip applicator to get any stray bubbles, just like that one that wanted to hide away from me. There's a couple right there, boop, 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 and boop. And you can keep on doing that vibration and tapping until you can get a good majority of the bubbles out and cleared. A couple stray bubbles in there. You really want to avoid any bubbles because that's going to create a weakness in your model or the, whatever procedure you're going to be doing. So it looks like this is getting this is pretty good. I'm going to move on to filling this whole piece. And as I fill, give a couple little taps to go and float into all those void spaces. A little tap there. Now that I got it relatively filled, you might see that there are some spaces that don't have as much as others in here, and we're going to want to correct that. Now, as your material starts sitting here for a while, you're going to be noticing that it's starting to firm. Well, you can use a little bit more of that firm material to go and fill up these areas without it falling out of place. Just like my maxillary one right here that's been sitting here at the same rate as my other one, this has a little top right here that's going to start to firm up here in a second. So I'm going to use the rest of my material here to go and fill up and create a small little base, but it's not going to uh, be too high. Uh, what I like to tend to do is, these are nice, I like using a little bit more of a wider spatula to go and pick large pieces of them up and start almost kind of creating a little bit of a cake. You don't want to start vibrating anymore here for the most part. You want it to stay relatively tall as you go and pack your material in here. So I just kind of vibrate it and let it fall into the place that I kind of want it to be. I'm hovering this over my bowl that I mixed all my material in so that if anything spills, no harm, no foul, it just stays within that little contained messing bowl. I'm going to keep this little maxillary or mandibular one off to the side until it starts firming up and then we can use another, then we can do our next step. I keep it leaned up against a tray at a little bit of an angle so that it doesn't slop off and fall out the, the posterior of the teeth. Now I'm going to go and clear this bowl to get the rest of my material out of here. This is why I tend to like this larger spatula here for all my other pieces. There we go. Now, depending on what you're going to be using this, if this requires to be have a base on it, you may want to go and flip your material so that the material sits on the tabletop and creates a flat surface. You may be going to a model trimmer later and trimming that up however much you need. If you worry about air bubbles, a lot of the times, just as we think of air bubbles, will always float to the top, just like in a glass of uh, soda or anything like that. The air bubbles flipped are in this orientation. The air bubbles will try to go up to the top, which is going to be the base, away from our teeth, and that's probably the more desirable place where that we want them to be. If you have a little bit more of a runnier mix and you go and try to flip this over, it may try to pancake out, or the material that's inside the teeth may try to start to slowly flow out giving you an incorrect uh, model. Uh, but what I tend to do is just leave them like this. If I'm going to be doing like a bleaching tray, then I'll go trim up all the inconsistencies as I need. But if I need to flip it, as I'm going to do right now, uh, then we can kind of wait for it to gently firm up a little bit. And right now, as I go and test my material without vibrating it too violently, I can see that it still has a little bit of flex when I go and kind of poke at it a little bit. So I don't want to go and play with it too much. I'm going to let it set up just a little bit longer. Same thing as I do for this maxillary. These both are going to set just at about the same time, so we want to be real conscious about uh, what we're doing here. We don't want to go off to the side or go back over to sterilization, go off uh, somewhere else and then forget about these unless you're not concerned about um, the bases and you're just going to trim those up anyways. So kind of pick and choose your battle for what that's going to be. 
But now that this is for, for the most part starting to firm up to what I want it to be, I'm going to go and flip this. All I'm going to do, if you have more material or you want it to be thicker, grab that material, pop that sucker on top. You're going to prepare it, prepare a spot where you're going to land it on, either using a couple of these different little squares. I like using paper towels because they'll soak up the water that's in there and kind of make it dry a little bit faster. I'm going to go, flip it over, and I'm going to sit it right there onto my countertop. Same thing over here on my po on my mandibular, flip it over, set it onto my countertop, and a little bit of a gentle like back and forth rock just to get it to kind of flatten out a slight bit, not too much. And the fun part is when you kind of get to smooth it all out prematurely. With that, I can go back to my little spatula here and clean up the sides a little bit on my maxillary one here. With that, this is going to give it a nice smooth texture on the outside. It's not going to have too much to trim up. I can kind of do a lot of my pre-trimming right here. If you start seeing that there's inconsistencies, such as on the edge of certain areas, you can use a little bit of your material that you have left behind to go and fill up any voids or anything that's not uh, completely filled. So I'm going to let that sit there nice and straight, put it off to the side for right now, let it, see, uh, let it harden up over here, kick this up on the side a little bit, right there. You, for a mandibular, you don't need any in the tongue area, unless you're doing a study model that requires there to be a little bit. Then you're just going to take your thumb and a wet finger and kind of smooth it out right here on the edge, or on the, on the tongue side to make it a little bit flat, but still leaving a base for that portion to be at. Put a little bit there on the back of my glove, smooth it out. I like smoothing out on my glove because if I come across an area that I need to add more to, I can just go back over to my glove and get it all back and then just add it to that spot. Such as I'm going to come over here to my man, my maxillary and add a little bit of a, a little bit more of a heel to this instead of wasting it. Now the important part to this that you really don't want to do is you want to be careful when you're trying to go and fix uh, your side your side portions of your stone. If you go and get your side portion and you go and, and wrap that, that stone up and around your tray, just like this as an example, and it goes and extends from the actual tray, uh, from the top of the, to, from the side of the tray to your cast, you're going to cause a little hook or a lock to go onto that tray and to make it difficult to dislocate later on. And you're going to have to take something and go and kind of crack it off to be able to loosen up your um, your model from there. So really avoid wrapping that uh, stone around the tray. It's called tray lock. And all you can all you need to do at this point, especially since it's not fully hardened, uh, you do it on the table. So you'd go and relieve those tray locking portions. If there's a little bit or if it sticks up a slight bit, hey, no, not that big of a deal. But when you have the full tray covered from top, bottom to top with a uh, stone and it's all connected, that's where you're going to have issues uh, throughout. You notice that my paper towel is soaking. It's taking, wicking all that water out of our cast, and that's going to help it dry a little bit quicker um, to where we don't have to wait as long to go and work on this on this uh, model later on, especially if you're a little bit more uh, pressed for time. As uh, we all know, when you're out there, there's sometimes not enough time to go and take their alginates and go pour them up and then work on that throughout the day. You're going to have to hit up a couple rooms. Um, but that's what we got for our pour-ups of our alginate impressions. It's going to work the same thing for PVS, polyvinyl siloxane, or any of these other uh, rubber or elastomeric materials, whatever we have out there. It's the same type of process if you use plaster, just a little more water is required than these ones. These requires less water, and as you go down to pink, blue, and green, it gets less and less and less. Be sure at the end, when you have all that poured up, is to get your bowl and your spatula nice and clean. Take that over to an appropriate laboratory sink so that we can uh, clean it up. All right, so now that we have our impressions all fully set now, 
we can go about we can go about taking them apart with the use of our lab knife maybe over a trash bin or over a tray so that we can prevent a lot of mess going on first things to look at especially when it comes to our impression is that it's actually nice and set you can go and place your impression on the back of a gloved hand so that you can check and see its temperature if it's the same day only like 30 minutes later if it's warm to the touch it's still setting up if it's cool or pretty much like ice cold to the touch that's when you know that it is ready to be taken apart starting with our base what we're going to do is take a firm grasp of our base right here and we're going to gently use our handle and go and wiggle and pull it off without hopefully breaking any teeth in the progress. If you need a little bit of encouragement with your lab knife, you can go and use it kind of like a um, kind of like a crowbar to lift pieces up. But the main thing you don't want to do with that, and the same thing when it comes to using your handle, is you don't want to just crank it up in one direction and almost like peel it back. Especially you don't want to peel it forward either. These teeth are going to be fairly brittle and you don't want to go and do a one universal force of motion. You're going to want to go and rock it out of the area. So if I go and put my lab knife down and I go and take my impression, I go give it a little bit of rock one side and I'm going to go off to the right side, a little bit to the front gently, and I'm going to do that whole little rocking motion back and forth until it kind of separates and finally breaks loose. As I have right now, it fully came off. There's no teeth left over in my impression, not too bad. And if I go and look at my teeth here, it looks like there's not too many air bubbles that are going to be causing me issues. A little inconsistency right there in the midline, but for the most part, not too bad of a pour up. Now you can see one of these little air bubbles that are gonna show up right here. And such as right at this little cusp tip, there's a small little bubble right there. Not too bad, we can go and pat, do a little patchwork job or anything, but this is pretty good. This is gonna be ready for trimming up in this next portion. If we go over to our smaller one, same thing. If you need to dislocate any tray locks, you can go and just use a little bit of your lab knife to go and get that separated if needed. There's a little bit right here, so I'm gonna go and sneak my way under there and be very gentle to break off little sections or pieces so that I can loosen up. Go from there, hold the base, left, right, up, down, back, forth, all motions, you're luxating, you're releasing it from the grip of our alginate impression. Put that off to the side and same thing, not too bad on the pour up. Now this is a actual patient, this isn't a type of knot, so they're not going to be having all the teeth and they're going to have a different orientation to them. Not too many bubbles for the most part, that's the nice thing about having a nice and creamy smooth mix instead of more of a rougher one. We can let this go sit around and dry. And as we come over to our mandibular, where we don't have a full base on the bottom to hold it, so you don't want to go and squeeze this together and possibly crack it right here off into the center, we can go and gently do little rocks back and forth um, but with uh, more care, more care to the whole cast. A little back and forth action, finally comes out. No teeth left over my impression. Put that sucker off to the side and we can check and see is there any bubbles in my models. Which doesn't look like there's any void bubbles, but there's normally little areas where we're going to have small little blurbs or small little extra pieces that we can go and gently and precisely take off of certain parts of uh, this cast. Usually when you go to take little of these, uh, these little blurbs off, you don't want to dig into the cast, you just want to go and flatten or smooth it off so that it doesn't um, alter the patient's uh, actual mouth that we have here. So I'm just smoothing some of these pieces out, getting a couple of these bubbles out. You can always use a little instrument, a little bit more care to it, but not too bad. This is going to be ready for trimming also, and that's where we'll come back into our next video.